Welcome to the Wednesday Bible Study. Uh, we're here coming to you from the Rick and Bubba Studios. Uh, I'm Rick Burgess, the co-host of the Rick and Bubba Show. That's my day job. That's what this studio does Monday through uh, Friday. Uh, but on Wednesdays at noon central, 1 o'clock eastern, it, uh, it becomes... Uh, uh, the place for a men's Bible study. And uh, we have men here in the room. We've been at this uh, in September, about 10 years we've been doing this Bible study. Uh, of course, this is a new studio, so we've only been here a little over a year. But if you would like to uh, uh, go find some of the past archives, other series that we've been through today, you're joining us as we're going through the book of the Revelation. But if you'd like to go find any of the other Bible studies that, that we've done, those archives are available to you. Uh, you can go to themanchurch.com, uh, click that media button, it's going to ask you if you want to watch the video archives or you just want to listen to the audio archives. And you can search different series and go back and listen to uh, you know, either things you missed in this series on your own time or any series in our past uh, decade. Uh, also, I want to remind you that themanchurch.com is a hub for a men's discipleship strategy. Uh, right now, uh, it is being implemented uh, all over the country and even in a, in a few other countries. Uh, what it is designed to do is to reach and disciple men. Uh, there's, a con- there's, a, there's a part of it that's called High Challenge. Uh, that would be our services and our conferences uh, where you're challenged uh, in a worship service designed for men with that tone uh, because you cannot reach and disciple men if you continue to speak to men like they're women and children. Uh, it, it, God made uh, men and women equal, but he made them beautifully distinct. Uh, and so there, there's a way that a man was designed, and, and, and we have that tone with everything that we do. Uh, so then once we've had our, our high challenge and our events and our services, then we offer high equipping, our discipleship. That's men getting in small groups, and we have 40-week curriculum. Uh, we have actually four of those now. So you can uh, you can look at those four, and we're working on our fifth. So if you're a church leader right now and you're, you're watching this or a community leader and you desire uh, to get something started, uh, you, you could contact us. We could get a game plan for you, and you could have your plan of high challenge and high equipping turnkey for the next five years. Uh, so we're, we're not talking short-term because discipleship is not a short-term thing. It's a long-term thing. Sanctification is something that, is, uh, that we are dealing with throughout the rest of our earthly lives right after we were justified. Justification is the beginning. It, it is not the end. So we're ready to help you. Uh, we also have individual resources for you to have in your own life if you're a man. Uh, we have those for you. We even have student versions if you would like to disciple younger males. So all of that's available at themanchurch.com. And speaking of the high challenge part of that, some of our men are going out to speak uh, all over the country at Man Church Services. These are services designed for men, and this will be the high challenge part of the strategy. Uh, August the 19th, a couple of markets, West Mobile Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama. Tim Ashley will be there. August the 19th, Hickory Hill Baptist Church, Westville, Florida. Brian Gunn will be there. On the 20th, we have three. Uh, Todd Jones will be in Heflin, Alabama at East Heflin Baptist Church. They'll start the strategy. Indian Springs Baptist Church in uh, Indian Springs, Alabama. I'll be there on the 20th. They're starting the strategy. And Stewart's Chapel Baptist Church in Flintville, Tennessee. They're starting the strategy. Tony Cooper will be there. Uh, now, if you're looking for the rest of the month, uh, the 23rd of August, I'll be in North Alabama. You don't get any further north in Alabama than Tuscumbia. So I'll be there at Parkview Baptist Church. They're kicking off the strategy. And on the 31st in Union City, Tennessee, Lee Moore will be there for our team, uh, and he will be kicking off the strategy with Calvary Baptist Church. There's others, but we don't have time for that in the Bible study, but you can find them by going to themanchurch.com. And if you need any help at all, you'll see a contact option there. Contact us, and our team will help you implement this at your church or in your community. So let's open up in a word of prayer. If you want to go ahead and turn, we're going to be in the Revelation chapter 17. And we're going to pick up today in verse 7 and then finish the chapter, okay? Lord, thank you for the opportunity to open your holy word. Thank you for the men that are in the room and the men and women that are joining us uh, literally all over the world. Uh, it's, it's been amazing, Lord, uh, to watch how you are moving uh, through something as simple as this Bible study and the, the modern technology that you allowed to be created uh, with the streaming and, and the archives and, and the podcast and all these different ways, Lord, as you told us. In the future, there would come a time when the world could be reached for the gospel. And we are living in that time. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you help us to understand what you're teaching us today. In your holy word, we pray 
in your name, amen. Uh, all right, so uh, we go to we go to verse seven. Now, if you missed last week, you need to go back and, and pick up uh, what was happening last week. Is is we've left the chronological order of of the revelation, and now we're diving into more detail. Uh, the the seven bowls of God's wrath. When we were back to chronological in sixteen, they're being poured out, and and we know that uh, the great Babylon is being destroyed, and we know the ant, ant, that antichrist. Uh, you know, the beast is being destroyed. But now John has got an opportunity with one of the angels, the seventh angel, uh, to to say to him, I'm sorry, one of the seven, we don't know which one it is. One of them comes to John and says, I want, we're going to show you more details uh, about the destruction of Babylon and Antichrist. And, and the first six verses we dealt with, when we get to the, the, the future, uh, when we get into the Great Tribulation, that there will be a false world religion that will dominate the entire world, and of course, it will be led by by Antichrist. Uh, and of course, Antichrist we know ultimately uh, is being led at this point uh, by Satan himself. So, we'll, 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 next, what happens is the last thing we saw when we saw the harlot, the prostitute, uh, and we in all the details of of her, the false church, um, last week. Now, we, when we left John, the words were that when he saw her, he marveled greatly. So the angel, when we start today, is actually going to pick up on that, that what just happened, and he's going to ask John, well, what, 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 are you, what are you marveling about? What, what, and, and look what it says, says, the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. So the, why, why do you marvel or why do you wonder? Uh, the angel seems to indicate that there really is no reason for John to remain puzzled about the relation of the beast and, and, and this beautiful but yet bloody woman in, in, in this vision. Um, the, the angel says that he will explain it. He will explain the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. Okay, so so John understands, because we just studied it, that the woman represents a false religious system. He's got that, and that the beast was the Antichrist. He's got that, uh, and, and even the angel points out, well, you see the seven heads, and you see the ten horns, which I've already told you about that. You've already seen that what all that represents. But what John did not understand, which is what the angel is going to explain today, he did not understand the connection between the two figures, he he didn't he didn't fully understand that. Yeah, I got that. That's the false religious system, and I got that that's antichrist. I'm a little confused about about how they connect. I'm a little confused about about how they uh, uh, work together and the connection. So so look at eight, and this is where the uh, uh, the angel will continue. The beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit. And go to destruction. And the dwellers on the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel to see the beast because it was and it is not and it is to come. Do, do you notice that? Because it's, it's Antichrist. You know, what, what do we say about Christ that, uh, that he was and he is and he is to come? Antichrist was, is not. See that that that's the big change there, and, and we'll talk about that. And is to come, so so we'll we'll explain that. So um, the the beast the angel says, look, he is um, he is you know going going to build this empire, and, and so what, what the angel wants to to talk about is he's 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 not going to concentrate so much on the empire itself when we first get started. He says before I get to the empire. That he's going to create. I'm going to tell you about a little more about the beast himself. So we know the beast is Antichrist. This is the satanic ruler uh, of of the last and most powerful empire in human history. We will have no other human empires after this one. This one will be more powerful uh, than any before it in history. Uh, it will serve as Satan's instrument to attack Israel and persecute all who are believers. Uh, and of course, the goal is to conquer the world for Satan, and ultimately do what again? Oppose Christ. I mean, this is Satan. Hey, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to relinquish uh, what I grabbed in the garden 
and 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 Satan foolishly thinks that he can mount an army of demons and and those who refuse to repent and all the things in, in his empire that he creates. He thinks he can build an earthly empire that is so strong he can oppose Christ. Now, he is sadly wrong. I mean, he's not even close to being right. But remember uh, that, that Satan is Lucifer. This is a created angel, and, and uh, he, he, he is not omnipotent. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent. So he is limited to what he can see in the future. So that's where he keeps getting these delusions because, you know, he doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so, so anyway, when you look at, at when he opposes Christ, when, when, when you're looking for Antichrist, remember these are things that have already been told to us throughout Scripture. We know that this Antichrist that is to come will be an outstanding orator, Daniel 7, 20, if you want to relate to that. This person will come on the scene, and, and you will just he will just tickle your ears. You'll be like, I just love to hear this guy talk. I mean, he is flawless. He's so influential. He, he, he makes, he makes uh, you know, Tony Robbins look like he can't even motivate anybody. I mean, this guy, we're going to love this guy. And then another thing that we know about him in Daniel 7, uh, verse 8, is that he'll be an intellectual genius. We will be blown away. With how brilliant, you know, you know. Think of all these things. You see how everything's birth pangs. Antichrist, something is he already on the earth? I don't know that. I don't know whether he is or he isn't. But here's what we know: you already see that, as we said when we talked about worship being corrupted last week. The thing that Satan does know is that God created us to worship, and we're going to worship something. So what he wants us to do, as we said last week, he wants to corrupt what we actually worship. Listen to the characteristics of Antichrist, and you'll find that all of these characteristics have already been on record that human beings love these things. We love, we love a gifted speaker. We'll even let him get away with bad theology if he's a gifted speaker, okay? Uh, and we love to think somebody is an intellectual genius. You know, when you look back when Paul was talking to the church at Corinth, and he goes, hey, what has this turned into? Some of y'all say you're followers of Apollos, the great orator. He was the great speaker. Remember when we studied that? Some of y'all say y'all are followers of me, the intellectual. He had all the education. Paul was brilliant. And the ones who, the, all the, academ, the, the academics of, of, of that day and that culture, the Roman culture, they loved that. And then what the other? And some of y'all say y'all follow Cephas. What's that? That's the celebrity. I actually was with, with Jesus. I was there. You know, I'm one of the original 12. You know, we got one of the original 12 coming to our church. You know, and Paul said, y'all got to drop all this. I, mean, I love when Paul said, I'm actually thankful that I only baptized a few of you, so y'all won't make me Jesus. And um, Which, by the way, you think if baptism is part of redemption, Paul would have been baptizing everybody. But anyway, so, so w w when you get to this, he, we'll also find what's the other thing we love. He'll be a brilliant military leader. The, no one, he'll make Patton look like a joke, okay? He'll let Napoleon look like a joke. Uh, he will be a military leader without parallel in human history. Daniel tells us that again in chapter 7, but this is in verse 23. And then, of course, you see this going on now. One of the other things Antichrist will have, and you find this in Daniel 8, 25, and in Daniel eleven twenty one, he will be a shrewd, calculating, manipulating politician. He'll be the, the most incredible politician the world has ever seen. This guy is on the scene to do what? To bring peace to the world. Antichrist. There ain't but one person going to bring peace, and it ain't Antichrist. It'll be a false peace that he's going to turn on you. Uh, it, 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 this, guy has finally come, this guy has finally come in. It's one of the things I always admired about George W. Bush. He didn't do everything right, and... And unfortunately, sometimes spiritually, he was so immature spiritually that he, he fumbled a few times when he had an opportunity. But let me tell you one thing I did respect about him. He didn't even fool with trying to bring peace to the Middle East. You know why? He said, I've read the book. It would be a waste of my time. You know, there, 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 there's, there's only one that's going to do that, and when they do it, it's going to be bad. Okay, so, so that will be Antichrist. And then, of course, uh, he will be the ultimate religious charlatan. Uh, he will be a charlatan like we have never seen before. All the cult leaders before him will look like they'll, they'll look like kindergarten, and he will he will eventually create a cult, which will be this false religion. And you find that in the New Testament. Uh, we hear, we find that in Second Thessalonians chapter two verse four. So 
the angel reviews all these points. Okay, that's what he's about to do. He's going to review all these points. So, uh, so in, in verse 8, he's described as the one who was and is not and is about to come again. Now, this, this, let me tell you what he's speaking to here. Don't forget, and we've already learned this, don't forget that Antichrist will fake death. There will be this, this fatal wound, uh, seems to indicate some sort of head wound of some kind. Maybe it's an assassination attempt that's faked or whatever. But he will attempt that he has been killed, that it's a fatal wound. So that's what he's talking about. This, what, that's what this title means. And he will fake what? A, he'll, a counterfeit resurrection. Now, when he does that, that's what the false prophet will use to deceive the world into worshiping Antichrist. Now, if you want to make a note, we've already covered this, and the angel is reviewing this. We covered this in chapter 13 of the Revelation, and look at verse 14. It's right there. Now, up to this point, Antichrist's political and economic power is going to coexist with this false religious system. They're going to work together, and it will be headed... Really, it'll look more because you need to get the false religion thing done. So the false prophet, whoever that is, this influential leader in the church, is going to kind of be the lead because everybody's going to look to him and say, well, you keep telling us this guy's okay. And then the false prophet will say, well, you saw him get killed and you saw him be resurrected. So I'm telling you, this is where our hope is now. And, And that will be used. But... And this is bad news for the false prophet, just like with everybody who makes deals with the devil. Uh, After this stage resurrection, Antichrist then will be completely indwelt by a powerful demon, one of those that comes from the abyss, and he will eventually turn on the false prophet and will will turn on the religious system that's been created, and he will destroy it. So... He, when he gets to this point, that's the, that's the description that you see from this angel. When he gets to this point, he will no longer tolerate any other religion than worship of him. So the false prophet's got to go. He'll, he'll kill him, and, and, and he, he will say, I'm, I'm, I'm the only thing we worship now. This, this new church y'all come up with, this new false religion, let me tell you what the center of it is. That'd be me. And, and everybody will worship him. And this is going to happen, if you like knowing the timeline, this event that I just talked about that we've already studied, that now the angel is reviewing, look for that about mid-trib, okay, about three and a half years in. Uh, he's going he's gonna to appear to reach the apex of an undisputed leader of the world and declare himself sovereign, and, uh, and he's going to be ready to go and try to stop the coming of Christ and his kingdom, and he will fail miserably. All right, so he also refers to dwellers on the earth. What does that always mean in the Revelation? These are unbelievers. These are those that have refused to repent. So that, that they're always referred to as dwellers on the earth, another sign that there is a rapture. Okay, that's another, another, another that the church has been taken. Uh, and, of course, these unbelievers, they also took, um, you know, the mark of the beast. They've done all that. And what, what, how does the angel refer to them? Their names are not in the book. They're doomed. Their, their names are not in the book. And, and so they will, they will marvel at, at Antichrist, mainly because he's faked a resurrection after a fatal wound. Uh, and, uh, but, but those who have already been redeemed, those that waited to the tribulation and repented, they won't be fooled. They'll actually stay the course. Of course, they'll be killed, but, they, but they'll stay the course. They won't be fooled because what? They've got the Holy Spirit. So they can discern that this is all faked. When, they, when the, those that refuse to repent, they can't discern it. So it fools them. Have you, did you notice that? I know for me, I hope it's been that way for you. If you've been justified and you've been reconciled back to God, that's, you, you, you know that, okay? That, that, you've repented. You've left faith in yourself. You're under the authority of Christ. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. Did you notice when you received the Holy Spirit, I did, that there were things in Scripture that before you didn't understand that you now understand completely? I mean, it, it literally like was put on a pair of glasses. When you, if you if you if you were nearsighted, couldn't see good. There's things in Scripture now that I, I I fully understand that I could not understand without the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know, Paul talks about this. He says, "Look to, to those that have not been redeemed. This seems they can't understand. This is all folly to them." So so anyway, when he talks about the seven uh, the, the the mountains here, 
Um, that always stands for kings. That's the seven kings. The It's an Old Testament metaphor. If you go back and look, kings are referred to as mountains. And what this represents is seven world empires that are embodied in their rulers that, that have been set up by Antichrist. Now, keep in mind about this next thing that he says. Now, follow this when we get into nine, okay? He said, now, this is going to call for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. That's seven kings. It represents seven em- empires on which the woman is seated. That, that's, that's who's standing under this false religion. They're all being endorsed. She's being redo- endorsed by all these, these kings. Now, look at 10. They also, uh, they are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. So, what in the world is he talking about there? Well, I'll tell you what he's talking about. Five have fallen. One, uh, you know, is uh, the other has not come yet. Now, the five that have fallen. That represents the Gentile empires that by the time John is, is getting the revelation, they've all fallen. So and, and, and so and and so by the time he gets the vision, Egypt is over, Assyria is over, Babylon, the first Babylon, is over, uh, Medo Persia over, and the Greeks have all fallen. So there's the five Gentile empires, and so that's why the angel said, Now five of them have already fallen. And that's those five. So the one, obviously, what's going on when he's getting the, the he's getting this revelation? Rome, Rome's still in power. So that's the one that is. So what is the one to come? The empire of the Antichrist, the the new Babylon. That's the one to come. So that's what the angel is talking about. Now, one thing you got to kind of love is that the angel who's getting excited about this huge defeat that is coming, he said Antichrist may be the final world empire, but it ain't gonna last long. He says at verse 11, Antichrist will reign for a little while. And, of course, he is the eighth king that he's talking about. And <clears throat> the reason why he will also be one of the seven is because, remember, he, he's in power uh, when he fakes this death, and then he comes back at the resurrection, and that now represents him being the eighth king. He's now taken control of the entire world. So he was one of the seven before that apparent, dem- uh, apparent demise, which was fake, uh, but he becomes the eighth king when he appears to be resurrected. Now, that will be the second phase of his rule. That's the Great Tribulation, but he will go to destruction, uh, and unlike all the—I love this— unlike all the other empires before him, okay, his empire is special. Remember what I told you about man-made global warming? Don't worry about you playing a role in burning the earth up. God has saved that for himself. What has happened is all these other empires have been destroyed by other human beings— but, but Babylon, the new Babylon and Antichrist, God said, I'll take this one. He destroys it directly. It comes directly from him. Not through, I mean, he, not through anybody else. He takes them out. And he takes them out in a hurry. Uh, so, uh, so look at verse 12. And, and the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. Now, keep in mind, one hour just means a short period of time. It's not a literal hour. So the ten kings that the Antichrist will give power, but only for one hour, or it'll be short-lived, just like because all this is going to be destroyed. During their brief reign, they will unanimously be devoted to Antichrist. And one purpose, they only have one purpose, power and authority to the beast. So what he's going to do when he says, hey, I'm, I've got it going on now. I've destroyed the fake church. I've destroyed the false prophet. All worship is mine. I'm building an empire, and I'm going to stop Christ for establishing his kingdom. I'm going to defeat Christ. I'm headed to Armageddon, and, and I'm going to face him, and I'm going to defeat him. He takes ten people, and he puts them totally in charge of these ten places of his empire, and they are there solely to, to bring glory to him, to give power to him. Everything that they have belongs to him for his use, for his disposal. And I love that the angel says to John, but don't worry. Their reign will be about, is going to be about an hour, which means it's going to be a short period of time. It's not a literal hour, but that has always been used to mean a short period of time. So now let's get to verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, 
and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So the agenda will be to make war against the Lamb. And who is the Lamb? Of course, that's Jesus at the Battle of Armageddon. And I have seen this battlefield and where this is going to take place, and uh, they got plenty of room. So the, the, the three demons will, will be the agents that will gather these ten kings and their empires. Now you can see that also in uh, chapter 16, uh, verses 14 and 16. We covered this. Remember these three demons? We talked about this, the ones that look like frogs. Remember that? Uh, so the details of the battle, we will study that, gentlemen, if you want to make a note when we get to 19, and it, you, it'll be great. But here the angel just says that the lamb will overcome them, okay? The lamb will overcome them. He will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those, those of us that have been justified, we don't get a lot of action, but we're with him. And, and the angel is saying that, the, that, that and those with him will be with him, okay, and are called and chosen and faithful. So th- these are the ones that have been faithful to Christ. These are the overcomers. Now I want you to think about something. And this, I, I literally, when I was preparing this, I got so fired up thinking about this. So when we studied the Gospel of John, we know that John's Gospel, it, its role is to say, behold the God-man. Every time I've got you know people that I'm discipling right now that are new to the faith, and I tell every one of them, and they say, where should I begin reading the Bible? I say the Gospel of John. Because you need John to introduce you to Jesus, you you need you got to get you need you know him. Now remember, I made the mistake of not realizing that one of the guys I'm discipling had never read the Bible before, and he went and read the Epistles of John, and that was on me. I didn't rem- tell him there's more than one book of the Bible that has John's name on it, and he was spending time basically learning about the Gnostics. So anyway, I said, all right, let's. Uh, that's not that's not the one I meant. I meant I meant the I meant the Gospel of John, and I had to show him where that was, and then he got in. So. You know, hopefully most people have someone mentoring them that's not as goofy as me and gets them to the right spot. But anyway, but in think about and Jesus is constantly telling everybody that he's there to do the will of his Father. He's constantly telling them that I that that, that he is God, that he is God's mouthpiece. He now has the authority. Now, see, I always think about this, and it's okay to think about this. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is John sixteen thirty three. Well. See, I always read that is that Jesus has overcome my sin, which is true. Jesus has overcome my problems, which is true. And he tells me that I need to always have joy in my heart and never lose that and never lose peace because he, even though there is tribulation, in the English Standard Version, the word tribulation is used there. I know some of the others may use a different word. He said, I say this so that you have peace. Now think about what we're looking at right now. In this world, you will have tribulation. And he uses the word tribulation or the Greek word that means tribulation, okay? But always take heart or keep the joy in your heart because I have overcome the world. And what does the angel say the Lamb's going to do? Overcome the world. He will defeat them at Armageddon. See, I've always seen that from just the the temper, I mean, just right in front of me. But there's a deeper thing that Jesus is saying. He's certainly saying that, and we can apply that to our daily life. That's great. That's the beauty of the Word of God. But he's speaking, hey, trust me, this world's going to get worse and worse and worse, but as it's getting worse and as you're headed to the tribulation, understand on the other side of the tribulation, I win. I have overcome all that will oppose me in this world. And here it is. The angel literally uses almost the exact same words in 14, and he says, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them or overcome them, for he is Lord. So some of your translations will actually say, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. I have overcome the world. I win. I will be the last standing king. I am the only Lord. I am the only king. All others will be destroyed, and I will destroy them. So if we're with him... We're protected. He has overcome the world. And uh, so that that's beautiful. And we'll go as far as to say this battle that is coming, using the word battle is really a stretch. When when we get when we get to nineteen and twenty, you're gonna see, okay, the word battle is a bit a bit hyperbole. That's not much of a battle. 
Uh, see, that's what you got to understand. Don't you ever let demonic forces or just your sinful flesh, don't you ever let it convince you that, that this garbage, look, Star Wars, it's fine. It's make-believe. I'm not saying that, you know, look, I'm going to go out and declare Star Wars evil. But this yin-yang stuff is some, that, that, that is, that's Far East mysticism, you know, where there's good and bad, good force, bad force. It's all equal. One's good, one's bad. You know, there's no equality in Satan and his, and his demons and Jesus and his angels. It's not even close. It's not even close. I mean, the drop-off, is, you'll see this when we get here. Jesus has no issue slaughtering them in just seconds. I mean, it's a joke. So get out of your mind that there's some battle going on for your soul and the, and, the, and the powers that are after your soul are equal in power and you better pick the right one. That's not the gospel. The gospel is Lord of Lords and King of Kings completely obliterates all that oppose him, including Satan himself and his demons. OK. And if as a matter of fact, if you look and I know some people don't like this, but you have to take that up with God because I didn't come up with it. You you look at stories like Job. He's a pawn. He has to come ask God what he can and can't do to Job. Now, some people don't like that God allowed him to test Job, but but you'll have to take that up with God. I'm not going to question him, but if you want to, you can try. Uh, I know that whatever he's done in my life was right because it was for my own good. And and how did it help Job? Job finally realized that he looked good compared to other people, but compared to a holy God, he actually was he had to despise himself and still had sin to repent of. One thing suffering will do is get you in such an intimate relationship with, with God, you'll realize how sinful you really are. You know, and he uses it for your good because it. I wish it didn't work, but it does. So in this case, once again, you see the angel going, John, look, it's going to look bad for a while, but don't you worry. Uh, we win. So now in, in verse 15, and the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated, that's the harlot, uh, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So the extermination of the harlot, uh, Antichrist, turns on the false religious system uh, now, th- this, this is graphic language here. He, he, he depicts extreme violence uh, of the Antichrist and his henchmen. They will destroy this false religion, thus refusing to share worship and likely to take the wealth all for himself. Because remember, this false church is going to be wealthy. It's going to have a lot of money. Okay, they always do. And uh, he's, so probably Antichrist is going to destroy any opposition to him, like sharing worship, but he's also probably going to take all the wealth to fund his ongoing uh, getting ready for the battle against Christ. But, you know, the thing that is so sad about, uh, about uh, Lucifer and Antichrist under the demonic powers of the, the demons of his from the abyss is God is behind this every move, and all he does is play right into his hand. And he says, so the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated, that's all the peoples and the multitudes and nations and languages that, that were, are worshiping this false religion. And look at 16. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. Here comes that violence. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. The false church is going to be annihilated by Antichrist, and it's going to be ugly. So anybody who decides, I guess, they're not going to worship Antichrist even here, even though there's no hope for redemption for them, the Antichrist is going to slaughter them. And he's going to take out the false prophet. That's going to be ugly. And this church is going to be laying naked and desolate. And it goes as far as as to say that Antichrist will even devour her flesh. That's going to be an ugly, ugly scene. And that way all of that is going to come back to him. But then look what happens next. Here it comes. For God has put it into the hearts to carry out his purpose of being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast and to the words of God are fulfilled. Who's doing it? Who's doing it? Who's making them hand all the power to the beast? God. 
You, you see God, you think God's all suddenly just lost control of this situation? See, he knows for them to be defeated on the Battle of Armageddon, let's get them all in one boat. They'll be easier to slaughter. God has put it into their hearts to turn worship over to Antichrist, to turn everything over to him. God is doing this because this then will play into God's hand. So, I mean, he, he is just an instrument being used by God and, and, and really has no say in what is happening. As always, Satan is an instrument of God's purposes. The one world unification government uh, so long sought, you know, all the humanists right now, you know, they're, oh, we want one world, one world government. We could solve all of our problems with one world government. Why do, why do you think that's in their hearts? See, what's so funny is sometimes we're so stupid to think that we've got to stop this. We've got to stop this. God, God needs our help. Oh, no, we, 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 we can't let this turn into a one world government and God's up there just doing this going, you know we're going to a one world government, right? I'm guiding this all the way to one world government so I can finally end this thing. Can I tell you something interesting about that? I talked to a guy this week, uh, and and he he has gone through uh, the, the same difficult thing that our family's been through, and many have, and that's the earthly death of a, a young child. And he and his wife, you know, it's, it's just been a hard thing, but, but they are glorifying God. They've become more devout to, to Christ than ever. They're influencing many other people. So I get a text the other day from him, not from him, from friends saying, hey, you know, he's having a heart attack right now. They're, they're putting him on a, a helicopter. I was like, wow. So you know, we began to pray and all this. So he and I got to talk. He survived it. And we got to talk um, this week. Was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. And um, he said, can I tell you something weird? And I said, yeah. He goes, I couldn't get a smile off my face. I said, what do you mean? He goes, as I was in cardiac arrest, I was smiling. And I thought to myself, I may be finally going home. And he said, all I could think about was, I'm about to see the Lord that has redeemed me. I'm about to be done with all the garbage of this world, and I'm about to see my son again. And he said, and they, and they were talking about, why is this guy smiling? He said, I couldn't get the smile off my face. He said, I had zero fear, none. I thought to myself, if I die, so what? And he goes, and then, of course, when I started hearing everybody talking to me and they got me fixed and all that, I thought, well, I guess there's still more for me to do but I was more than willing to go. So he got to the place where Paul got, look, to live as Christ, to die as gain. And so what, what God is saying is, really, when you sit here fretting over this one world government, you're really fretting over and basically telling me you don't like my plan. And it also, you know what it also means? You're clinging to an idol. You're clinging to the world as if this is where your fulfillment is. Now, I'm not saying that we just give up. I'm not saying any of that. You know, we're, you know, we were instructed, too, that once we've been redeemed, we don't go sit on a mountain and just wait for Jesus to come back. We're supposed to be working. And and we we can we want to vote. We want to do whatever. And we can sit there and go, I tell you what, that's going to be trouble because it will be. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a one-world government, and there's nothing you can do about it. And you'd be better off just to say, I think I'll live my life that when I die my earthly death or if I'm here when he comes to get us, I'm going to be about his business, not fretting over you know, clinging to some government or clinging to some country to try to give me what only God can. Nothing wrong with being patriotic, but there's something wrong with worshiping the country. I'll tell you that. That's wrong. Because I got news for you. This country ain't going to mean anything when we get down to this. You need to look at the freedom that you've been given and I've been given. You know how we should look at it? Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to so freely worship you and, and go out and evangelize other people. I'm so thankful for the freedom to do that. That's really why I was given this freedom. Not where I could try to have health, wealth, and prosperity and build heaven on earth. I was given this freedom so I can openly worship you and that I can openly go out and tell other people about you. We have been given more freedom because we should be thankful. That's why we've been blessed. We don't have the difficulty of these other places where they could get killed tonight. Now, it's getting where the church is, is not as, as loved as it once was, but that's also it. That's prophecy. We should, we should expect that. You know, we, 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 you know, I haven't seen the movie The Essential Church yet, but I want to see it. You know, where we, there were some pastors that had to take a stand. 
we had some people that you know their cities tried to tell them during COVID what they could and couldn't do and all that. So you see that all these are all these are our test balloons. Let's see what we can get away with. You know, we had the Houston mayor that wanted the pastors to turn in all their their sermons so she could take out anything that said God is you know has a standard of sexuality and a standard of marriage and a standard of intimacy. You know, she didn't get away with that, but they tried it because God has blessed us with a constitution. That says if you try to do that to us, you really can't. Now they may get to the point where they just say, "Well, we're going to change it, or we're going to do it anyway." But, but don't misunderstand why you have freedom. Our freedom is for the advancement of the kingdom. It's not for our own personal leisure, our own personal satisfaction, our feeding our flesh and the desires of the flesh. It is so that we can be more effective. And if you look, this country and its wealth has funded the advancement of the kingdom around the world like no other country ever before. And that's why we're blessed. So uh, so anyway, uh, so this is going to happen. And so these humanists, that, that they're going to see this one world government coming. You know what they're going to say? Finally, yay! This is what we've been waiting on. And, of course, we're all going to be going, oh, it's over now. You know it. And uh, so, so anyway, they're going to get what they want. Uh, and as soon as they get it, it's going to be destroyed in one great act of divine judgment. I mean, as soon as they get it, they're finally going, yay! Have you, have you ever seen the, what's the Shrek movie where, where Pinocchio turns into a real boy for just a minute, and he's jumping, I'm a real boy, I'm a real, oh, and then as soon as it goes right back, they're going to have a, just a glimmer of a moment, they go, we finally did it, and then God's going to say, and y'all are all gone. And it's back to what I intended. All the words of God, every prophecy of Christ's return, and, um, and the setting up of his kingdom will be fulfilled completely, completely, completely. Listen to this, Isaiah 42, 8. I love this. I am the Lord. That is my name, my glory. Of course, that's Yahweh. I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols, Here's what the Lord wants everybody to know. He will share his glory with no one. He will will share his praise with no one. Here's what you must understand, and we need to take the same approach because it is the nature of God. God hates false religion. God hates anything that has been put in his presence place where only and he's not going to have it so the thing that you you don't you don't want remember what we've been told many times remember what he said through jeremiah i want to i want you to give them a message of life or death and this is when he was judging jerusalem he said if they bog down in this city hey i'm bringing nebuchadnezzar i'm the one doing it hey the babylonians are not their hands not against you my hands against you they're just puppets I take note of that. I'm doing it because I'm judging you. I'm refining you. And Jeremiah, you tell them if they'll come out and they'll let the Babylonians take them into captivity, the Chaldeans, if they'll let them take them, they'll be in slavery, but I'll come get them and they'll live. But if they hunker down in this city of sin and they refuse to, really what he's saying, repent, then they're going to die with it. So if you decide to go with the false religion and you decide to be caught up in some sort of cult that exists even now and you cling to something that is in conflict with God, you're just going to die with it because he will remove anything that is not of him. He shares his praise with no one. So let's look at verse 18. Now, verse 18, it's almost like verse 18 is it really blown. I mean, it, it, we're almost going back to Babylon again, and, and we get, it's almost like the angel. You ever know, it's almost like the angel. Oh, oh wait a minute, I forgot something. And by the way, it, but he says, and the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Now, what he's talking about is this great city, Babylon. Um, and, 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 it, and, and if you look at it, all the different theories you have on what is, what is this is this a is this going to be the return of rome is this 
you know, like I say, some people who are way off the beaten path. Is this the United States of America? Or are we Babylon? It feels like Babylon, but we're not Babylon, okay? But this, this is going to be wealth that has never been seen. And it is true that if you go over in Iraq and over there by the Euphrates River, and I told you all this before, but I take a note of this. It's kind of like when I made the funny joke about Matthew 24, uh, when, um, and I hope you all have studied that by now. By the way, if you're new to the class, Matthew 24 is a requirement to come back next week. Um, is when Jesus is saying, as in the days of Noah, talking about when, when it all starts, the tribulation coming. And I said, have you ever thought about the fact that we have literally built back the ark? As in the days of Noah, we have the ark back, and we've literally rebuilt it. And, uh, but in this case, I, uh, another thing that's kind of funny, if, if you just go Google some news stories out of Iraq, they've kind of started thinking to themselves, if they could rebuild ancient Babylon, because they have the ruins. I mean, they have the original Babylon. If they could rebuild it, they said one of the things they'd like to do to bring tourism to Iraq, and this would be something that could bring them more revenue, is that they will what they want to build Babylon back so that people from all over the world can come see how glorious it was. Now they're next to some oil supplies that they won't have any problem funding that. Okay. And so there's already talk of we want to build Babylon again. Most people believe that because when we look at all the prophecies, there seems to be a discussion of Babylon that looks beyond the Babylon that has already fallen. Uh, there's, a, there's a new Babylon, and they keep, there's a lot of reference to the Euphrates River there and the return of Babylon. And, and so Babylon will be the capital city of the empire of the Antichrist. Old Babylon's destruction by the Medes and the Persians, see, that isn't the full fulfillment of the total destruction. That really was almost like a partial destruction. So that can't be it because it really wasn't totally destroyed. It was partially destroyed and can be repaired. Now, when God takes it out, uh, it, it, there'll be no repairing it. Uh, and, and so the location of these ruins of the original Babylon, they're still there, and it's still a very strategic location near the Persian Gulf and the richest oil fields in the world. The prophets are clearly seeing a total destruction of a future Babylon, and they keep pointing to that Euphrates River. What else do we learn in the Revelation? There are demons that are being held captive under the Euphrates River because we know they get released. So this, any notion you hear that it's going to be Babylon is going to feature something that's already here or the return of the Roman Empire, if you go through the prophecies, it doesn't really stand up real well to to. Uh, biblical scrutiny. Uh, most theologians say, no, we're going to talk about the rebuilding, but even to a greater standard, a new Babylon. And it'll be the capital city of this empire that Antichrist puts together. But again, it, uh, it will not last very long. It's going to have a very, very short run. So again, um, how does that apply to how we're living right now? Well, every time we study one of the books of the Revelation, I don't know about you, but things pop up all around me that are birth pangs that I'm seeing right now. You know, like last week, uh, the, the, the world religion has not been established yet that will be the harlot or the prostitute, uh, but I don't know about you. I sure do see false religions cropping up everywhere. You know, if, if you want to think about even our faith, the last count that we got, and which is one of the reasons why I've kind of moved away from using the label I'm a Christian because it really doesn't mean anything. There's nothing wrong with it. You're not doing anything wrong to say that. Uh, if you want to know, tell people where you stand, and we talk about this in here, tell them you're a follower of Jesus. The room will take a different tone. And one of the reasons why the word Christian doesn't hold much water right now is there are currently 37,000 versions of it all over the world. 37,000 that call themselves Christian. So when you throw that out, people are really pretty comfortable with it because they're like, well, you could be one of these Christian faiths that, you pretty much do whatever you want to do anytime you want to do it, you know, and you've added things that aren't really there and, and all that. So, cause remember, if you go to the new Testament and I'm not against that word, don't hear me saying that. I'm just talking about you being stra strategic cause even, because we know Peter told us embrace that word, but remember in, in the new Testament, it's only there three times and, and, and two, two times it's derogatory cause they were making fun of the new followers of Jesus and the way in the new church and they were saying, look at them trying to be Christ-like. They're trying to be little messiahs, little Christ. And then Peter says, take it as a badge of honor. So there's nothing wrong with it. Don't hear me saying otherwise. But 
in the New Testament, over 250 times we're called disciples. And, and remember, and we've talked about this point before, but it's really, really crucial. This is the problem we got with the Western church when we started treating justification as, as the end, not the beginning. When you look at Jesus and what he's telling them to do, to go be disciples and make disciples and teach them all that I have commanded, there's no one in the New Testament that takes the label Christian that wasn't already a disciple. And what we're doing is we'll call you a Christian when you're not a disciple. I mean, you're, you're a baby. You, you, you really haven't earned that title. Uh, you haven't been discipled. You haven't grown up. You don't know anything about Scripture. You, you haven't applied any of it to your life. So we are called to be disciples and make disciples. And, and, and then, if you want to be called a Christian, once you've established yourself as a disciple, you can. But what I, what I think we need to watch for, especially preparing for what's ahead, is letting somebody be called a Christian that we really have not seen the fruit of that. Um, and, uh, and so we, we make disciples. So if you really want to be bold and you want to make sure that, that nobody in the room is confused, if they ask you about your faith, say, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I'm one of, I'm, I'm one of his modern-day disciples. I say what he says to say, and I do what he says to do. He is my Lord, and I'm under his authority, and he redeemed me. And, uh, and now I obey him because I was redeemed, which means I didn't know him. Now I know him, and now that I've continued to get to know him through my sanctification, I love him, and now that I finally love him, I actually obey him. Right? So, so that's, that, that's kind of how, how, how it should work as we prepare for what's ahead, because as I said last week, where we're moving, the thing that you're going to see more and more and more, we've been warned about it by Jesus, warned about it by Peter, warned by John, warned by Paul, is that as we're moving forward, the false teachings teachings and false prophets and false teachers, they're only going to grow. And it is crucial that we be able to discern false teaching. It is crucial. And part of the you being committed to coming here and studying the Bible, uh, I commend you for that because um, I know that uh, there was a time in my life I didn't do that, and I paid a horrible price for not knowing what I was talking about because uh, the days that we live in are evil, and we were told by Scripture to live as the wise, not as the unwise. What does it mean to be wise? To fear God, but also to know his word. And, and, and you know, I, I, was, I was laughing about that, and we'll close. So... The, the day job that I have uh, is I do a radio show, and we do a weekly podcast now because you, you must have a podcast. I don't know how to tell you all this. If you don't have a podcast, you're a loser. Uh, so uh, uh, the whole wide world has a podcast now. But anyway, uh, so that's one of the things that we do. Um, and it is so interesting because Adler, you know, who, who does our YouTube channel, you can see those numbers immediately of how many people view things that we put on YouTube. Um, going to get the numbers on the audios, you have to take an extra step. But it's usually eh, about the same or maybe a little more on the audio. But, but what's funny? So I've, we've done podcasts, and we have this Bible study, okay, which is available. And any podcast we do where we bring somebody in to unpack the Word of God and we're talking about things in Scripture, you get, what, out of 7,000 views, uh, you might get 10,000 audio listens. The Bible study every week gets about two to three thousand on the video, probably about the same on the audio. Okay. Now, if I talk about UFOs, I talk about Bigfoot, hundreds of thousands of views, hundreds of thousands of listens. So the Word of God, the 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 Bible, that a supernatural being. The beginning and the end, the I am has said, if you want to know who I am and what I expect of you and how you can be redeemed, it's all here. And you know what response that gets? Eh. Now I start talking about a spaceship landed somewhere. I start talking about aliens, Bigfoot. The world goes wild. So that means they sure are easy to deceive. And they have no interest how can you not be interested in a book that was written by God? How can we be so apathetic about that? Think about how many men you know that, that don't read the Bible, but if a football coach puts out a book, they read it from cover to cover. See, this deception thing is not going to be very difficult at all. You know? And, and, and so 
Let's not be that way. I hope that the Holy Spirit has sanctified you and, and all of you to the point where I have radically, radically been changed. Now, I'm not saying this out of anything other than how wonderful God is, okay? I don't know. I can't explain my love for the Word of God now. It's unexplainable because I never had it before. Had no interest in it. Never read books. Never wanted to. Now, as I continue to be sanctified, the power of God is so strong, I struggle to care about anything else. I'm really not interested in it. People start talking about you know football season. I'm like, I, I had a guy sitting in here in the studio one day, and he said, uh, it was interesting to watch. I said, what do you mean? He said, I, I've, I've seen the old shows, you know, when sports and all that would break out. He said, buddy, you were zoned in. He said, I don't think I've ever seen you look more bored. I didn't even notice it. He said, you were looking around. You weren't even paying attention. And I said, yeah, you know why? It didn't really interest me. But now somebody bring call call the show or bring up something they don't understand scripture or what do you think about that or here's what I heard in church or do, do you think that's good theology? Buddy, I, I light up like a lot because that's what drives me. That's what I'm interested in. And now, you know, it's funny when I say that. Why is that a unique thing to say? Shouldn't it be? It's the most important thing there is. Why does that seem odd? So as you see this deception that is coming, it'll be a homecoming game. But don't let it be, don't let it be one of you. Know what you're talking about. Go find what he said and be ready. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today, and thank you for this incredible opportunity to unpack your holy word. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, but you know what was wonderful? The peace that we all have here and the peace they all have out there that are watching and listening, knowing that you win. Okay, I mean, because of you, and I want everybody to hear this because there's so much fear and so much attempts at fear. Uh, let's just fear what we should, and that be God. But let's not fear the things we shouldn't fear. Lord, thank you for the peace that we can say with zero reservation and we're not saying it like it's some sort of TED Talk or, you know, it's some sort of psycho Bible. You have reassured us. And it really is true because of you. Now, not for those who don't belong to you, but for those of us that belong to you, everything really is going to be all right. And that's why you said you say this so it will have peace. Because when you say you've overcome the world, that's the peace that everybody's looking for. And only you provide. So we thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, to help those that are out there that may be struggling, that may need help, if you are, reach out to me, rick at burgessministries.com. I'll be more than thrilled to help you. I'd much rather talk about that than some of the other emails I've got today, I promise you. So uh, if I can help you, I'd love to talk to you. Thank you, Lord, and we pray in your name. Amen. Thanks for being with us.